Welcome to Cushman and Wakefield's Capital Markets webinar for Greater China with a spotlight on Hong Kong. I'm James Shepard, Head of Business Development Services for Cushman and Wakefield in Greater China and based in the hopefully soon to be unlocked city of Shanghai. Yes, it's been a challenging couple of months here in Shanghai. However, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And as of yesterday, there were just 4,982 4, new daily cases, down from a peak of over 20,000 cases a few weeks back. My colleagues that have been working from home for one month or more report being extremely busy, but there's no doubt that the strict lockdown necessary to support the zero COVID approach will have a profound impact through Q2 and Q3 of this year. This will be true both on the demand side, but also will exacerbate the construction delays we have been experiencing recently as a result of the challenging debt environment for developers. Yet again, we've had to revise downwards our supply forecasts. More on this to follow later. While the rest of the world seems to be engaging in policy tightening in the face of rampant inflation, China has managed to maintain lower levels of inflation and continues to indicate a softer stance with potential for further policy support. We note that the government is planning a 14.8 trillion yuan investment in infrastructure in an announcement made on the 26th of April. Nevertheless, the Chinese yuan softened by around 3% last month as the US dollar strengthened. The PBOC stepped in quickly and announced on April 25th that it would cut the reserve ratio requirement for, on foreign exchange deposits by one percentage point to 8% effective May 15th, a move that should stabilize the RMB over the short term and will be welcomed by foreign investors in China. Nevertheless, the challenging environment for developers prevailed through the first part of the year, and we are seeing many seeking to diversify activities away from development, which may well create some acquisition opportunities. So let me tell you about the excellent speakers that we've lined up for you on today's panel. I'm delighted that today we have Francis Lee, John Su, Gordon Marsden and Tom Coe join us to share their views on the panel. Keith Chan will also give us an update on Hong Kong and Catherine Chen will host our panel discussion. As many of you will know, Francis is a prominent expert on China investment who has maintained hands-on experience in Hong Kong, mainland China and Taiwan for over 37 years. Francis has successfully closed a huge number of transactions uh, over his career. Under the leadership of Francis in 2021 alone, Cushman and Wakefield's Greater China Capital Markets team completed 30 major transactions with a total consideration of around 35 billion RMB or approximately 5.5 billion US dollars. John Su is Managing Director of Cushman and Wakefield in Hong Kong and leads a team of more than 240 professionals to provide a full range of real estate transaction, consultancy and related real estate services. John has been working in the industry for 32 years. His experience includes tenant representation and strategies in the office, industrial, logistics, and data centers sectors. He is also deeply experienced in landlord advisory for grade A office developments and corporate occupier account management. Gordon sits in our Asia Pacific capital markets platform and for the last 14 years has been based in Hong Kong. Today, he's joining us from the UK. Gordon primarily works with global, regional and cross-border investors and supports our team on major divestment mandates across the region. Tom serves as executive director and head of our capital markets team in Hong Kong with 25 years of experience, culminating in a total transaction value of nearly 50 billion Hong Kong dollars across 70 transactions. He's supported institutional investors such as AEW, Blackstone and PAG and well-known local investors such as CSI, Kerry and Wang On. Moderating today's panel discussion is Catherine Chen. With over a decade spent working with Cushman and Wakefield, Catherine is our subject matter expert for capital markets research in Asia Pacific. Prior to this, Catherine has led and worked on many research and advisory projects for multinational investors and developers. She's also spent time working in North America, Shanghai, and is currently based in Hong Kong. Before we get to the panel discussion, I will run through a quick update on the Q1 Greater China market performance overall before I hand over to Keith for a spotlight session on Hong Kong. Keith is head of research for Cushman and Wakefield in Hong Kong and has over 14 years of industry experience. The urban unemployment rate in mainland China hit 5.8% in March, driven in part by ongoing layoffs in some of the largest Chinese tech and real estate companies which started late last year. 
The recent lockdown will cause ongoing headwinds in the short term, but we hope to see employment start to recover in pandemics and sensitive industries such as construction, transportation, F&B, retail, hotel and tourism industries later this year and early next year. In Hong Kong, the seasonally adjusted unemployment rate climbed 5 to 5.7 percent from the January to March period due to the fifth wave of the pandemic. With the recent relaxation of social distancing policies and various government support schemes to drive employment and boost consumption, we expect the job market in Hong Kong to recover in the near time. In March, the Purchase Managers Index for mainland China's manufacturing industry hit 49.5 while the Logistics Prosperity Index trended down to 48.7. This was driven by COVID-related supply chain disruption in many locations. Again, we expect to see this contract further given the current lockdown envir environment. In Hong Kong, the PMI fell to 42, the third straight month of contraction in private sector activity. In the short term, the recovery here will be partly reliant on the unlocking process in mainland China cities and particularly the situation in the southern part of the mainland. Overall, retail sales in mainland China grew by 3.3% in Q1. However, in March, consumption started to weaken amid increasing COVID-19 related restrictions. Online consumption had remained a bright spot, but we will, will be impacted by the situation in Shanghai and in some other locations given the restrictions on delivery services. Developers are still experiencing ongoing challenges as they restructure to live with lower levels of gearing. Right now, it's all about the cash flow. On this slide, we can see three charts which give us some visibility on the prevailing trends in the development of residential in light blue, retail in grey and office property in dark blue. The two charts on the left represent area and the one on the right represents investment volume. The first chart on the left represents the short term where over the last two years we could see in light blue residential construction floor area maintain positive growth through both the pandemic and the restrictions on debt. This was supported by developer flight to strata titled off-plan residential sales in a bid to capture more immediate cash flow. At this trajectory, the residential sector too now seems set to join commercial sectors with negative growth in Q2. Moving to the chart in the middle, over the mid to long term, this suggests supply pipelines will continue to soften for all key property types. On the right, we can see new development investment trending downwards to negative territory for all sectors. Negative growth here emphasizes our view that the mid to long term we will see less supply than in recent years across all key property sectors. When we look back over the last two years, we see that construction delays and sales of completed projects to owner occupiers has meant that only 30 to 36 percent of new office supply has made it to the leasing market. According to the revised developers' schedules provided to us in Q1, a reduced 9 million square meters is now planned for 2022. However, given there is no significant easing in developers' access to debt and construction disruptions caused by COVID, we have adjusted down our own supply forecast for 2022. In addition, given the emphasis placed on developer cash flow, we expect an increasing proportion of new supply will be purchased by owner occupiers, further reducing the level of future supply to the office leasing market. Demand remained relatively strong in tier one cities, but had cooled significantly in tier two cities. This softening of demand was largely COVID related, but also saw some lingering impact of regulations that were targeting the education sector. On the demand front, we can see historically this bottomed out in the first half of 2020. Given the typical three year lease cycle in China, the prevailing employment situation and COVID related challenges, it seems absorption will remain relatively soft through 2022 and into the first half of 23. Depending on the economic environment at that time, it's possible a boom in absorption will be released thereafter, given the three year leasing cycle and the last demand boom that we witnessed commence in Q3 2020. Meanwhile, absorption in Hong Kong remained positive for the third consecutive quarter, despite the city's fifth wave of COVID and tightening of social distance policies. Many tenants took advantage of the perceived bottoming out of the office rents to relocate. 
the banking and finance sectors performed well, accounting for around one third of new leasing transactions this quarter. More from Keith on this later. On the left, we can see that most cities saw positive absorption. However, in cities such as Tianjin and Chengdu, COVID related challenges had a negative impact on leasing. In Nanjing, demand for grade A office premises weakened as a result of new and better quality supply in the grade B and business park markets. A similar trend was observed in Beijing. Shanghai registered the highest positive absorption of all cities in Q1. Obviously, Q2 will see this soften significantly given the current lockdown. All markets in Greater China now have lower rentals than pre-COVID. However, some have been more resilient than others. Shanghai, Guangzhou and Taipei and tier two cities average rents saw modest declines of two to eight percent. The more expensive markets of Hong Kong, Beijing and Shenzhen saw greater declines. In Q1 2022, only a few markets registered rental growth. Qingdao rental growth was largely driven by new higher quality development launching to the market with above market average rentals. Q1 total investment was 53 billion renminbi, down 42% quarter on quarter and 18% year on year. Shanghai and Guangzhou generally fared better than other markets. On the right, we can see the share of inbound investment increased in Q1. Primarily, this was led by Hong Kong based investors. Of that 34%, the majority of this inbound investment came from Hong Kong. On the lower left hand chart, we can see that Shanghai was the most active market in Greater China in Q1, driven by strong demand for business parks. Guangzhou saw strong demand in Q1, accounting for 19% of the total transaction volume, thanks to active domestic buyers and a recovering office market with strong absorption and relatively low vacancy rate. Office investment accounted for nearly 60% of the city's total investment volume this quarter. In Hong Kong, investment volume cooled through Q1, with retail accounting for 37% of the total consideration. Overseas investors remain conservative in ex executing deals in response to the fifth wave of the pandemic, while local buyers saw the period as a window of opportunity for bargain hunting, especially for retail assets. Both Beijing and Shenzhen saw relatively quiet Q1 due to spring festival holiday period and COVID related challenges. On the lower right, by sector, office assets, including business parks, remained the number one investment choice for in investors in mainland China while the share of industrial investment has increased significantly and has become the second most favoured asset type. The increase in Q1 was driven by the sale of the DLJ logistics portfolio to GIC backed ESR, the largest transaction in East China to date. In the mainland retail investment activity was weak in Q1 and will likely remain so while COVID restrictions continue to pop up from time to time across the mainland market. COVID has had a significant impact on China real estate investment market of late, and it will moderate investment activity through the remainder of the year. So with that, I'd like to pass you over to Keith to look at the Hong Kong market in a bit more depth. Keith, are you there? Yeah, thank you, Jamie. So um, in Hong Kong, uh, market activities were dampened by the fifth wave of the um, pandemic outbreak as a city recorded tens of thousands of new cases daily in early March. Many companies adopted remote working during the most difficult time and delayed decision making. That being said, office leasing has been holding up quite well as most of the activities were being concluded, uh, were initiated well before the fifth wave. On the left hand side, the chart shows that the city re recorded positive lead absorption for the third consecutive quarter in Q1 amounting to nearly a quarter million square feet. According to our data, about one third of the new leases were driven by the banking and finance sector. Not surprisingly, most occupiers favored the core the markets, such as Great Essential and Tim Sacho. In many cases, tenants have been able to upgrade their workspace in core locations at a discount. Office rents on average have dropped by less than 1% in the year to date period. As shown on the right, rents in Greater Central and Kowloon West have been fairly stable over the last 12 months, 
whereas rents in Tim Sa Choi suffered a relatively deep correction of 7.5% on a yearly basis. The biggest challenge for the office sector, however, is that there will be circa 3 million square feet of great new grade A office space entering the market by year end. Together with the existing available stock, which is about 9 million square feet as of today, the influx of space, of space will not only take time for the market to digest, but will also put pressure on rents going forward. We anticipate a 2 to 3% annual decrease in overall rents, while availability rising from 13.6% at present to around 16 to 70% by the end of the year. Looking at the retail sector, again, the fifth wave of the pandemic prompted widespread curtailment of consumption and resulted in an inactive retail market. In the first two months of the year, domestic retail sales fell by 4.9% year on year, with luxury goods and fashion dropping the most. In contrast, sales in medicines, cosmetics and supermarkets increased during the same period. Amidst uncertainty, the weakening settlement has dented retailers' confidence it was reflected by the rising vacancy in all major markets, as you can see from the chart at the bottom. They have all reached double digits, the highest level on record. Due to the tightening social dis distancing measures, some businesses were again forced to close. For example, fitness and sports centers, movie, cent uh, movie theaters, bars and pubs, and so on. Indoor dining was also prohibited after 6 p.m which quickly affected the F&B sector. In response to the higher vacancy, landlords adopted a number of approaches. For example, some would leave their property idle, waiting for quality long-term tenants. Some would take a lease term of two to three years from large reputable brands, and some would lease their space to short-term tenants in the hope to receive certain income and maintain flexibility when the market rebounds. Rental adjustments have been in the range of 2.5% to 4.5% year to date in the light of rising vacancy. Tourist driven markets such as Causeway Bay and Chim Sa Choi experienced the highest vacancy. In sharp contrast, the performance in the industrial property sector has been outstanding over time. On the one hand, the pandemic has led to the rise of e-commerce and the lead for virtual meetings and online entertainment, triggering unprecedented demand for properties such as logistics warehouse, cold storage facilities, and data centers. On the other hand, thanks to the industrial building refertilization scheme initiated by the uh, Hong Kong government, many eligible assets are now in the midst of the redevelop redevelopment process, leading to a substantial decrease in available stock. In Q1, the availability of prime warehouses across the city has been consistently standing at low single-digit levels. Despite uncertainties ahead, citywide rents are about 10% higher than a year ago. Turning to the investment sector, the total consideration of major transactions amounted to about 11 billion Hong Kong dollar in the first quarter, only 14% lower than the previous year. If we compare this with the first quarter in 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic, the investment volume has increased more than threefold. It is also worth looking that there were a couple of key transactions in April that were eye-catching. We will come back to, to the particulars in a minute. In terms of property sectors on the right-hand side, industrial properties have emerged as the most attractive asset class, particularly among investment funds, comprising about 40% of the total transaction volume so far. Many investors look to purchase industrial properties for value-added opportunities, such as conversions, upgrading, and redevelopment. Hotels are also recorded some investment traction, comprising about 12% of the total transaction volume. As Hong Kong gradually loosens inbound traveler quarantine requirements, the hotel sector is slowly emerging as an attractive asset type in anticipation of high occupancy and potential opportunity for conversions and upgrading. 
On the other hand, we have seen a few partnerships between co-living operators and institutional funds to purchase hotel properties at deep discounts. The plan is to reframe them into co-living or serviced apartment products. We will likely continue to see this trend emerge in the future. Moving on to the specific investment deals, I wanted to highlight the two large size in industrial deals uh, recorded this year so far. The first is the cargo consolidation complex on the left, located in the, uh, in the Kowloon West district, which is an on-block industrial building currently occupied for data center use. This deal is by far considered the most expensive industrial deal in Hong Kong with the US real estate fund Luvin as the buyer. It was transacted at 2.88 billion Hong Kong dollar, translating to more than 10,000 Hong Kong dollar per square foot. This is the third time the building has been transacted since 2015. Previously, the investment firm PAG acquired the building from Australian industrial developer Goodman for 1.36 billion Hong Kong dollar in 2015 and sold it to a local investor for 2 billion Hong Kong dollar three years later. This indicates that both industrial facilities and data centers are in high demand from an investment perspective, despite the price levels set at record highs. And other notable transactions involve the Victoria's factory building on the right, which is a strata titled industrial property located in Calvin East. The property is expected to be converted into mini storage use. The transit price set at 182 million Hong Kong dollar, translating to approximately 4,000 per square foot. As industrial conversion and upgrades into alternative uses such as self-storage, cold storage, and data center become increasingly attractive, investors will further look into transforming these assets into value-added propositions. Institutional funds have been particularly active this year in the hotel sector. Rosedale Hotel in Calden West was purchased by a partnership between Reef Living, a co-living operator, and Angelo Gordon, an international investment manager, for 1.38 billion Hong Kong dollar, a circa 12,400 Hong Kong dollar per square foot. Meanwhile, fund manager P. Jim partnered up with another local co-living operator Dash Living to purchase the Casa Hotel in Kowloon West for 519 million Hong Kong dollar. As we can see with both of these deals, operators who are lo locally based with in-depth local operational expertise are seeking capital and partnering up with international investment funds for large-scale hotel acquisitions and conversions. Before jumping into our investment outlook, let's take a quick look at how the city's economic prospects look like. We expect overall economic growth in Hong Kong will remain flat in 2022, although the real GDP in 2021 re rebound by 6.5% from a previous low base of 20. We expect this growth to slow down this year due to the earlier fifth wave of COVID-19, geopolitical tensions, as well as the expected rise in interest rates. Higher than average growth is expected in 2023 and 24. Meanwhile, we foresee inflation rates to continue rising in this year, eventually surpassing the blue dashed line of the pre-pandemic five-year average in 2023. This may likely be exacerbated by the recent spike in oil prices forging greater pressure on overall commodity prices. Nevertheless, we expect unemployment rates to gradually trend down from this year onwards. As economic activities are gradually resuming, we believe the labor market will slowly recover from the current level. On the interest rate side, we expect the cost of borrowing will increase significantly, with interest rate likely surging in the coming years, particularly given a long spell of excessive QE globally. For the investment outlook by asset class, we expect industrial hotels and development sites to remain the core focus for investors. 
First, industrial will remain the most sought after as investors look for the new economy usage, as mentioned previously. Industrial assets in Hong Kong are limited in supply, but demands remain high. With long-term stable income, high value add, and counter cynical qualities, the key demand drivers for this sector will likely be from institutional funds, operators, and also local developers. Meanwhile, hotel, hotel assets will also uh, be receiving investment traction. Buyers will typically keep the original use or convert the property into multifamily for lease apartments. The market is currently filled with bottom fishing opportunities with strong upside potential and high value add qualities, given that the city's robust housing demand will likely remain unhindered in the coming years. The key demand drivers are typically multifamily operators and, insti and institutional funds. Last but not least, we believe it is a great time to consider development sites. With the recently proposed Lofton Metropolis Plan by the Hong Kong government, we expect both ground up development and redevelopment opportunities to be very attractive. However, this will strategically depend on the infrastructure provisions and favorable policies that drive land value appreciation, particu particularly in the new territories. In this regard, local developers with strong track records could be a reliable local partner should international funds be looking to set foot in real estate developments in the city. And that's the end of my sharing. I will now pass on to Catherine for the next session. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Keith, for sharing your thoughts on Hong Kong investment market. Now it's our panel discussion time. Please feel free to leave your questions in the Q&A box and we will try to answer them within the time allowed. I'd like to also remind all panelists, please turn on your camera. Um, the first question I saw is on inbound investment into mainland China. So I'll give this question to Francis. Um, given China's current COVID zero policies, do you think this may delay investors' decision on their China commitment? Yeah, thank you, Kathleen. Um, given uh, the situation in Hong Kong that we have a uh, peak case back in the early March, and then about uh, a month and a half later, in the mid-April, I think uh, we, Hong Kong have been uh, slightly to start opening up to the, the, the world in terms of global traveling and then uh, make uh, property investment possible in Hong Kong, especially from the international investors' perspective. So I believe uh, given uh, the situation in Shanghai is now under, more under control now, and uh, we expect in the second half of this year, more uh, our international investor will be back to the market to catch up with um, um, the, 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 the investment uh, into China. So the, I will expect the uh, activity will be uh, much, much uh, greater and better in the second half. Thank you, Francis. Uh, the next question I see is on Hong Kong versus other cities. So I'll ask Gordon this one. What do you think Hong Kong's competitive advantage is when comparing to mainland China and other Asia Pacific cities? Uh, thank you, Catherine. I mean, I guess as we sort of sit here today and as we've just heard from sort of Keith is that that prospect of recovery, um, you know, as we are experiencing um, sort of elsewhere in Asia Pacific. Um, you know, more holistically and it's unchanged is that accessibility and general kind of liquidity, albeit in moderation, but at speed and with a clear sort of real estate legal framework that Hong Kong kind of offers. Um, one that's very applicable, I think, to the experiences of the last couple of years, and then it's been alluded to in a couple of the, the case studies that Keith has made reference to, um, is that sort of asset management expertise that you get in Hong Kong uh, and the good sort of third party professional services, which have allowed, despite the kind of the lockdowns um, and restrictions in place on travel, um, for deals to continue and for asset enhancement initiatives uh, sort of to be implemented. Um, and then um, as we move forward, obviously this sort of continued integration with the sort of the GBA. Now you might sort of say that's three cities, not kind of or three major cities, not one city. 
Uh, but I kind of think in respective of that, you've then got to be looking at Hong Kong in the context of and in comparison to, you know, Tokyo's um, uh, greater sort of Tokyo metropolitan area, um, you know, the greater Seoul area uh, and indeed sort of the eastern seaboard of, of Australia. Uh, and in all those respects, um, you know, it looks fairly favourable. Uh, so with that, back to you, Catherine. Thank you, Gordon. So speaking of Hong Kong, um, I, I'd like to ask John the next question on Hong Kong now versus uh, first pre-pandemic. So Hong Kong's border has been closed for over two years now since the start of the pandemic. Could you give us some insight on what has been changed in Hong Kong's real estate market since the pandemic? Yeah, sure. I think uh, the uh, differences between uh, pre and post pandemic are from a uh, real estate investment uh, perspective is that uh, we have seen uh, a lot more uh, institutional funds are uh, going after uh, real estate assets, especially those uh, uh, non-traditional assets like data centers, uh, mini storage or uh, warehouses, uh, logistic centers. Uh, before that, um, I think the um, investors in terms of buyers uh, category, uh, there, there is a good mix of uh, everything, uh, developers, uh, local investors, and also institutional funds. Um, so I think that's uh, one major difference um, before and after. And uh, in terms of uh, asset classes transaction, I think uh, the uh, pre-pandemic uh, situation uh, is uh, more diversified uh, because uh, we have seen um, office retail, the traditional asset classes are, were being gone after by the uh, institutional investors and also uh, local buyers. Whereas uh, now um, the alternative asset classes like data centers, warehouses are uh, highly pursued uh, by institutional investors. Um, and But one thing hasn't changed um, uh, before and after is uh, the development site for residential um, projects. And I think developers uh, are still going after these uh, sites uh, because uh, the uh, residential market in Hong Kong is still very much uh, in a promising position. Thank you, John. So, so you you've mentioned many sectors, uh, including the residential market. Um, so Keith, uh, Keith previously mentioned hotel as a hot investment asset class in Hong Kong, and some investors are betting on robust housing demand for hotel uh, conversions. So I'll ask Tom this question. What do you think is the advantage of such hotel uh, conversions comparing to uh, residential units? And where do you see the demand will come from? And also someone in the audience also mentioned there's currently emigration out from Hong Kong. So what's your thought on that? Thank I you, Tom. Uh, thank you, Catherine. I think for the hotel sector is because the border uh, closed for almost three years and the normal hotel business is not good. And maybe some of the owner of the hotels is uh, under a little bit uh, operation pressure. So they are willing to lower their asking price compared to three years ago and uh, relatively like down by almost 30% as uh, we can record. So uh, some institutional fund thing, it is a good timing to bargain with those owners and then run those hotel as a service apartment. But actually for for the tenant itself, uh, as the audience asking, it's not a lot of new uh, demand. They are just uh, competing with ordinary residential units. So uh, on the operational basis right now, the figures just maintain the operation, but uh, the play behind uh, this uh, hotel acquisition is uh, once the border opens and more tourists come, come back and they can uh, sell it out as a real hotel afterward. I see. Thank you, Tom. So they can now use the hotel as multifunctional. So they can either use it as service apartment or as hotel when the border finally uh, reopens. So that's uh, interesting to hear. 
Um, how about the data center investment in Hong Kong? Maybe I'll ask John as you are the data center um, expert in Hong Kong. So how sure. do investors um, underwrite um, <clears throat> given the current low yield environment for data centers? I think uh, based on the latest transaction, uh, the cargo consolidation complex, uh, the yield was trans uh, the transaction was uh, concluded at a initial yield of uh, 2.85%. That's kind of a record low for data center uh, asset. Uh, but the um, beauty of a data center uh, asset is the uh, rental term and also uh, the rental escalation. Uh, typically, uh, for a data center lease itself, uh, it could be as long as, say, minimum 10 years. Some of them could be as long as 25 years or 30 years. Um, and uh, I think this uh, uh, is actually a very attractive from an uh, investor's point of view, because uh, if they're looking for long term um, uh, return for from from the property itself, uh, this is uh, the uh, most attractive part of, uh, of a data center asset. And um, the other thing is about the rental escalation, because uh, we have seen uh, quite a lot of data center uh, leasing transactions uh, actually build in a uh, annual increase of rent of say three to four percent. And uh, for example, after three years, uh, the rent of the asset will appreciate roughly 10 percent, which is not something seen easily found in some other asset classes uh, in Hong Kong. So I think uh, if uh, the investor will uh, keep the property uh, for three years or five years and uh, the yield will increase as a result of that. Thank you, John. Um, the next question is um, as, uh, related to the previous question on hotel conversions. So the question asks about Hong Kong mar multifamily market. Um, so I'll ask Gordon uh, this one. So how do you compare Hong Kong's multifamily market with Japan and mainland China in terms of attractiveness? Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, I mean, they are very different markets in terms of establishment scale today um, and, you know, how groups may be able to sort of participate. Um, if I try and answer it, um, by reference to kind of what are some of the the, the attributes uh, of the sector and um, there's been kind of other reports um regionally um that have highlighted you know the focus and the preference today for value add uh, investments and for capital raising in the value add space um sort of secondly one of the things that uh, I'm conscious of is that there aren't too many investors that absolutely must deploy capital in Hong Kong. In contrast, uh, they do need to employ capital in you know, sizable markets like Japan and uh, China. Um, but you know, as we have seen, they do need to participate regionally uh, into the growth sectors of you know, logistics uh, into um, multifamily. So you know, the old adage of, of, of beds and sheds uh, and indeed some of this new economy stuff. Uh, and then picking up on what Tom was saying about the sort of and Keith about the sort of cyclical state of uh, you know the hotel market in Hong Kong. You put those sort of three ingredients together. Um, <clears throat> And you know it allows for you know participation today into the Hong Kong uh, multifamily arena. Um, so you know in that respect, it becomes accessible. Uh, it becomes something that investors can deploy capital into at, at sort of moderate levels, but be able to you know execute an asset enhancement scheme on. Um, you know, so so actually driving. Uh, rental growth, not specifically through inflation, but actually through improving the quality of the product, including the services um, provided to the consumer of that product, uh, and also obviously also sort of plays that ESG piece as well. So, you know, I think today the there are some uh, really sort of positive um, messages around the offer that Hong Kong can provide uh, for the for, for the multifamily sector, uh, and that is in 
you know, contrast to, you know, should we say Australia, which is see more of a build to rent, so more construction orientated at the moment, so sort of ground up development, um, or you know the the evolution of you know the market in in China, which is inevitably one of scale. Um, so you know there is a place, and we're we're seeing that in terms of the investors that are now participating in the sector. Back to you, Catherine. Thank you, Gordon. Um, I, I see another question on interest rate expectations for Hong Kong. So I asked Tom uh, this one as you're a Hong Kong investment expert. So as Hong Kong is externally driven and given the US Hong Kong currency pack, uh, what are the interest rate expectations for Hong Kong given recently down yields of sub 3% for logistics and data center sector? Do you foresee rising interest rate costs to create upward pressure for yields? Yeah, we are seeing the rate hike from the US, uh, 50 basis point uh, yesterday, and we are expecting uh, at least one or 1.5 percent more later this year. And we are seeing some pressure on some pure rental properties. As uh, Gordon just mentioned, that uh, uh, as the rate hike, uh, the especially institutional investor are uh, looking for more uh, 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 asset appreciation and uh, 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 modification rather than pure rental growth uh, for after the rate hike. And uh, one interesting thing is we recently seen two institutional investor pairing up with Hong Kong local uh, developer. Uh, to buy sites for redevelopment to achieve that kind of uh, uh, IR they're expecting in in spite of the rate hike. Back to you, Kendry. Thank you, Tom. Uh, the, the next question I see over here is on Hong Kong office market. So um, I'll probably ask John uh, uh, um, this one. So do you see the new norm of hybrid mode of working result in negative impact on office demand in Hong Kong? Um, that's a good question. I've uh, been asked uh, the same question many times um, since uh, COVID. Frankly speaking, I don't think that is going to be uh, to, to have significant impact on office demand in Hong Kong uh, because the hybrid model is uh, working in certain industry, but uh, probably not in every single industry. And uh, and the uh, work from home arrangement uh, is a kind of a temporary arrangement for quite a lot of multinational corporations. And we have seen uh, quite a lot of reports or um, um, statements from uh, CEOs of uh, large corporations saying that uh, their staff are all back to the office. I think um, the from a user's perspective, uh, the uh, work from home environment is flexible. Uh, it's uh, accommodative, uh, but uh, it doesn't help in terms of building company culture, creating uh, synergy amongst the, the workers in the office. And I think business decision makers uh, will uh, probably find the right balance between work from home and work from office moving forward. And in a Hong Kong context, I think work from home is uh, quite a challenge because the Home environment for a lot of the employees uh, is quite cramped, uh, unlike the uh, Western world. So um, I think uh, most office workers will prefer to work from the office um, if COVID is over. Thank you, John. And the, the, the next question I see is on Hong Kong industrial investment. So we saw uh, re recently, there's increasing interest in industrial investment in Hong Kong, especially cold storage facilities. Um, Tom, could you share with us the different aspects of industrial investment in Hong Kong, especially under the current industrial building revitalization scheme? Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Yeah, we see a lot of activities uh, last year and this quarter about industrial uh, properties in Hong Kong from an uh, institute investor. Uh, since the introduction of revitalization 2.0, uh, we uh, see a lot of Hong Kong developers and investors uh, to demolish the the old industrial building into uh, a new industrial building or uh, logistics or data centers. And uh, because there are 
a certain uh, way to improve the value of the industrial building. So uh, like we said before, like mini storage, cold storage, logistics, and even data center and or some new industrial buildings for short title per sell purpose. So uh, there's strong demand for that kind of properties and and people are thinking that the replacement cost is still high because of the construction cost in Hong Kong right now, even for industrial building is something like 3000 or up to 3000 something. But uh, some of the industrial building are trading at that level. So it's just equivalent to the uh, construction cost. They they think there's a bargain for that that particular sector. Thank you, Tom. Uh, let me see. Um, the the next question I see is on Man and China market outlook. So I'll ask Francis uh, this one. So Q1 was uh, relatively quiet in the Man and China market. What's your view on the remainder of the year? Do you think the market will become more active? Yeah, thank you, Kathleen. Um, Traditionally, I think Q1, we have the Chinese New Year holiday, which uh, will be a uh, quiet market. And also, the, as we see, the Shanghai and then the part of, uh, of uh, Shenzhen and now part of uh, Beijing is now under sort of lockdown situation. So we uh, end up at Q1 and also part of uh, April is uh, still pretty slow. As I said, um, most of the, especially those foreign investors, raise a lot of money. They have to get them invested in China. So I will expect in the second half of this year, uh, they will be back to the market for site inspection, for negotiation, for engaging the consultant to go through uh, property DDs. And uh, I will expect more uh, transaction to be concluded in the second half because uh, China, after all, is a very important investment market for our investors. Given uh, China is the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, second uh, largest economy in the world, and also China has been opened up to international investors for almost like 20 years. And uh, also, the, apart from they start investing on offers on uh, shopping mall, now they are investing all over into logistics, data center, uh, business park and also the multifamily in a way. So the, uh, uh, given the, the breadth and the depth of the market, I would expect uh, the, the day will come back. And then actually we, we've been uh, talking to investors, planning the, the trip, hopefully in sometime in, in June or, uh, or the later part of this year. So the, uh, I, I personally be quite uh, optimistic in, in the second half of this year. Thank you, Francis. Uh, uh, Gordon, do you have anything to add on the Man and China investment market? Do you think inbound investment will become more active later? I, I, I was just going to, I was just going to put it in a in kind of a regional context. We know yeah. that sort of last year there was kind of 210 billion US dollars of commercial activity around the region. You know, China represented 50 billion, uh, you know, of that. Whilst you know, Japan, South Korea, Australia were sort of 40 billion each. And um, so, you know, I've been talking to, to to colleagues around what we think for the for the year ahead. Um, and in order to beat that 210, we need China to be active, um, given its contribution. And um, you know, I think we're comfortable that. You know, in other geographies around Asia Pacific, it will hit the sorts of levels that we've seen last year. Um, and, you know, I think that, um, you know, with with some um, uh, improvements as we move through this year, um, we will get to um, the same sorts of levels for, for, for mainland China. Um, I mean, Hong Kong last year had an incredibly robust year, notwithstanding the fact that it was um, in some respects, all lower value per square foot transactions. It was all being conducted in that industrial industrial revitalization um, sector, as opposed to you know large scale portfolio transactions or you know significant uh, sort of office deals. So you know the rebound is is in terms of investor activity is kind of poised to kind of happen, um, and I think that that will also you know happen in mainland China. Um, you know, as they get through COVID, and obviously there's there's still some, you know, challenge ahead on that front. Um, but there is still a prospect towards the back end of the year to have a very um, significant and robust uh, contribution to investment volumes regionally. 
Definitely. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Gordon, for your comments on that. I, I'm, I'm not sure if Jamie is still online because I see another question on the mainland China market. Jamie, are you are, are you there? Are you I'm here? Yeah. So, so could you kindly of talk about construction cost trends in mainland China uh, in, in terms of labor costs, raw materials and land, land price? Because elsewhere uh, in, the, in the world, we see there's a rising <laughs> In, uh, inflation cost on uh, labor. So do you uh, observe the same trends in mainland China? Yes, well, we are seeing uh, increasing construction costs in the, in the mainland market at the current time. Um, also, obviously, um, construction starts and stops have become a bit of an issue uh, with that. Um, we've got um, a number of projects um, which have been, I think, delayed uh, more than one time in some cases where COVID uh, lockdowns have been put in place. Overall, I think the big challenge at the current time to the developers is not so much the increase in the cost of construction costs, but it's actually uh, the developer debt, uh, the debt and getting getting hold of the debt at the current time. And as a result, we've seen that massive switch across to residential development um, and they've been pushing residential development, trying to get those projects to market to generate cash flow. And as a result, we've seen a number of commercial projects being delayed. So that's really going to have quite a significant impact on the market going forward and supply pipelines are constantly being moderated downwards, both by the developers who are talking to us, like in Q1 this quarter, the developers came to us and many of them said, look, this project's not going to get launched this year and pushed it back. But also we're monitoring these projects and we're actually moderating the supply pipelines as well. So I think that the big issue for the developers now is getting these product to market and generating the cash flow, not so much um, some increases in the construction costs. Thank you very much, Jamie. Uh, we, I think we still have uh, time for one more question. So I'll, la I'll ask the last question to Tom on Hong Kong market outlook. So uh, do you think the Hong Kong market will also become more active later this year? Uh, if so, where do you think the demand is going to come from? Yeah, after the fifth wave of the pandemic, uh, we can see more people are coming out of the uh, easing of the border control or even open up the border internationally or to PRC, we, we, we can see more activities will be happening in Hong Kong and then local investor will come out again and plus uh, some PRC users uh, to buy up some offices and that will create a very good atmosphere for institutional buyer to coming back for something like office sector or retail sectors. Thank you, Dom. Uh, uh, thank you, Tom. Um, so now back to you, Jamie, for the final remarks. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so yeah, that's been a really uh, fantastic uh, panel discussion there. So huge thanks to our Hong Kong Managing Director, uh, John Su, and our Capital Markets colleagues, Francis Lee, Tom Ko, and Gordon Marsden for their expert opinion there. Uh, thank you also to Keith uh, Chan for his Hong Kong presentation and Catherine Chen for her excellent, excellent moderation of our panel discussion today. Um, as always, please drop Catherine or myself uh, a line if, if you have any queries on Greater China Regional Research. Uh, and if you wish to subscribe for our Asia Pacific Investor and Developer Newsfeed, our quarterly market beats, we now cover over 30 cities in Greater China, or any other Cushman and Wakefield Thought Leadership publications that we can help you with. We're going to be back uh, next month for our Asia Pacific Capital Markets webinar featuring a spotlight on India, so do tune in for that. Thank you very much indeed for listening in. Keep in contact and we look forward to engaging with you again soon. Have a great day ahead. Goodbye.